It's very, very much of, of my pleasure to introduce Professor Gordon Graham, who's going to chair this evening. He will be well known to most of the people in the audience and well known to me for having been Regius Professor at the University of Aberdeen. But before that, as many people will know, he was at uh, St. Andrews University and lecturer and reader in moral philosophy there from 75 to 95. He is the editor of a significant number of books uh, and a founding editor of the Journal of Scottish Philosophy. And he is now the Henry Luce III professor. I don't know if it's a Henry Luce I professor or Henry Luce II professor. <laughs> he is a Henry Luce III professor of philosophy and the arts at Princeton Theological Seminary. And Gordon, if I may, I will just hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thomas Reed was born exactly 300 years ago 100 years after his birth, his star was firmly fixed in the uh, ascendant, not just in Scotland and in Europe, but perhaps even more so in America. It's almost exactly uh, 200 years since the then president of what is now Princeton University, Stanhope Smith, published his lectures on Reed, and they swept the country. 100 years after that, the position was completely changed, and Reed had almost sunk without trace. In the second half of the 20th century, thanks to a very uh, faithful, loyal band of insightful people, uh, Reed's name was just kept there, and now, 300 years on, uh, he has returned to the position that he is due. One of those people is this evening's lecturer, John Holding from St. Andrews University. <coughs> and actually, uh, amongst the things that John did to promote Reed, to bring him and restore him, was a special issue of the Philosophical Quarterly, which then became a paperback book and, uh, and arose from an essay competition and very importantly drew new young scholars into the field. He uh, likewise edited uh, a special issue of the American International Journal, The Monist, on the Scottish philosophical tradition. Again, this drew new people into the field. I owe my knowledge and interest of Reed directly to John, in fact, uh, because uh, when we were colleagues at St. Andrews and I was appointed to the Regis Chair at Aberdeen, he told me uh, that the thing I should do when I got there is make sure that Aberdeen made more of Reed than hitherto it had, I took his advice and launched a Reed project, which then eventually became the Centre for the Study of Scottish Philosophy, which eventually uh, went to Princeton. And so uh, you will see, if you look on the back of your, the folders that you had, that there are now four international organisations involved in celebrating Reed's centenary. And this is, this is in addition to the universities of Glasgow and Aberdeen, who had their celebrations just uh, back in March and uh, did so under the auspices of the British Society for the History of Philosophy. So I think we can safely say uh, that Reed is uh, back and no one is better qualified to tell us about Reed and his gifts than John Haldane. Thank you very much indeed. Lord Wilson, uh, Professor Graham, Gordon, fellow members of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, I'm very conscious of the honour uh, you've done me in inviting me to give this lecture in celebration of the life, work and influence of one of our most distinguished predecessors, uh, Thomas Reed. Uh, in fact, between Gordon's introduction and an article that I had in the Scotsman today, I think that's about the content of the lecture, <laughs> though his emphasis on it being uh, exactly uh, 300 years to this day I, it was a slight admonition, I think, because uh, today's Scotsman article that I wrote um, on Reed, uh, celebrating this uh, tercentenary, began by saying 300 years ago today in 1720. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that tells you something about me, no doubt, or perhaps the speed at which I was writing. But uh, what did strike me as interesting was that the editor and sub-editor managed to fail to notice it also. So there we are. At any rate, um, 
Thomas Reed, as I say, was born 300 years ago today. And in 1783, along with Adam Smith, uh, James Hutton, Adam Ferguson, and many other leading scholars and scientists of the day, he became one of the founding fellows uh, of this society. So we're honoring uh, one of our own. It's a mark of the esteem in which Thomas Reed has come to be held as a philosopher that the academic celebrations of his tercentenary, as you've heard, have already begun here in Scotland, and others are planned across the Atlantic. Last month, again this was mentioned, there was a major international conference held jointly and bilocatedly, though not simultaneously, between the universities of Aberdeen and Glasgow, entitled Thomas Reed from his time to ours. And in June, again as you've heard and is advertised I think somewhere here, there will be a further international conference, uh, this time in Princeton, New Jersey, which will examine the influence of Reed and other Scottish philosophers uh, in North America. Between them, these two academic festivals will have assembled the best of current scholars to present the fruits of their deep and extensive studies of the life, writings, and influence of Thomas Reed. Some of these scholars are present here today. In fact, I'd say the leading such scholar is present here today in the presence of uh, Alexander Brody. Some of these scholars are present here today, a fact which you will immediately appreciate could occasion some embarrassment. First, on my part, in failing to comprehend the complexities of Reed's thought or the details of the historical context in which he worked. And second, however, on their part, for being unsure whether to observe these failings or not. In fact, however, I have every confidence that in the celebratory spirit of the event, my colleagues will indulge any lapses. For the occasion is not one for specialist scholarship. Rather, <clears throat> it's intended to serve the purpose of describing and evaluating Reed's achievements in broad and appreciative terms, largely intel intelligible to those who have no prior and certainly no professional knowledge of it. I shall not, however, leave my colleagues entirely without something to discuss or to take issue with, since I want to honor Reed by suggesting that he has, uh, he has much still to teach philosophers today. Now in saying that, I'm thinking both about the particular issues with which he is best associated, namely questions in the theories of cognition, action, and metaphysics, and about the nature of philosophy itself, particularly as it, philosophy, relates to the natural sciences, as these are now commonly invoked in opposition to or in substitution of traditional philosophical understandings. And this will bring me, in due course, to the part of my title that refers to the art of philosophy and which hints at an understanding of the discipline that I believe is now under threat. So that's where we get to some age of controversy, perhaps. I mentioned the fact <clears throat> that the International Reed Tercentenary Symposia indicate the esteem in which Reed has come to be held. But as I think Gordon indicated, so far as modern times are concerned, this is a relatively recent matter. The beginnings of the Reed revival dates to 1941, with the publication of an edited and abridged edition of Reed's Essays on the Intellectual Powers, produced by the late Anthony Woosley. At the time, Woosley was in military service in the Near East as an officer in the King's Dragoon Guards. But he later held an Oxford Fellowship and became Professor of Moral Philosophy at St. Andrews. Woosley saw in Reed an affinity with the style of philosophy that was then developing in England, particularly the attention to ordinary language. And the diagnosis of revisionist and skeptical philosophical theories as arising from the misinterpretation or misuse of that language. One might say that Woosley rediscovered Reed. Certainly he'd come to be neglected even in Scotland, in part for want of easily available editions of his writings, but more, I think, because of a certain verdict on his system of philosophy, a verdict that goes back to Kant in the 18th century, but which was revived by the 19th century Scottish neo-Kantian and Hegelian philosophers. <clears throat> 
I have in mind, particularly in this connection, James Frederick Ferrier of this parish and in later years also a professor of philosophy at St Andrews. Prior to Woosley's 1941 edition, one would have to go back to the versions of Reed's works gathered and commented upon by Sir William Hamilton, which first appeared in 1849 and continued to be reprinted until 1895. These ill served Reed in two respects. First, they're uncomfortable to survey because of their double columns and small print. And second, because they encourage the reader to approach Reed's text via the many, often long and frequently contentious notes and dissertations provided by Hamilton himself in the effort to improve and refine Reed's own essays. No such improvement is called for, and what Hamilton offers is rarely, if ever, an improvement. While Woosley's edition with its more appreciative reading was therefore welcome, it had the disadvantage of being an abridgment of the work. And the serious business of producing a critical edition only got underway about 20 years ago under the general editorship of Knut Harkinson, initially with Princeton University Press and then and currently with Edinburgh University Press. These volumes are transforming the study of Reed among scholars and they provide a complement to the application of his ideas by philosophers who are concerned with questions of epistemology and metaphysics, which is to say questions of knowledge and reality. So happily, once again, as in his own time, Reed is coming to be read and appreciated. Well, now something about Thomas Reed, the man and his life. Reed was born in the manse of the parish of Strachan in Deeside on the 26th of April, 1710. Okay, that's clear, right? A year to the day, interestingly, prior to the birth of David Hume, and 15 years before that of Immanuel Kant. Reed, like Kant, Reed was to be brought to life as a critical philosopher by reflecting on Hume's <coughs> sceptical empiricism, which he, Reed, sought to counter by placing human knowledge on a better foundation than that of impressions and ideas. I'll say more about Hume's theory later. For these reasons, Reed has been described as the Scottish Kant. As it happens, however, Kant believed that his own grandfather was an emigrant from the northeast of Scotland, so he himself might al almost have borne that moniker. Uh, Reed's own antecedents were in no doubt on his father's side, he could number generations of clergymen and various officers of court. Through his mother, he was related to the Gregory family, which included a number of distinguished mathematicians. Three of his uncles were professors of mathematics at Edinburgh, Oxford, and St. Andrews, and two of his cousins held chairs of history and of mathematics, again at Oxford and at St. Andrews. One of these uncles invented the reflecting telescope, was a friend of Newton and introduced Newtonian science into the Scottish universities. <laughs> Several uh, of, the, of that Gregory's scientific instruments remain in the University of St Andrews collection to the present day. Well, with this family background, it's unsurprising that Thomas Reed showed an aptitude for study and an appetite uh, for the intellectual life. Educated at home until the age of 10, he then enrolled at the local Concordon School and two years later in 1722 transferred briefly to the Aberdeen Grammar School before entering Marshall College, college which subsequently was merged with King's to form at the University of Aberdeen. The college then operated the so-called regenting system in which each student cohort was taught natural, moral and metaphysical philosophy, that's to say uh, natural science, moral philosophy and metaphysics or speculative philosophy taught these by the same teacher throughout the entire course of study. For the three years of his time there Reed was instructed by George Turnbull. Himself a son of a Presbyterian minister Turnbull was an important figure in the development of Scottish moral philosophy in which as in other aspects of his thought he cautioned against rationalist a priorism and argued in favor of a broad empiricalism. Now, empiricalism here is a term of my own 
coinage, because I'm going to use it again to characterize Reed's view, in opposition to two extremes, a radical uh, a priorism to which uh, Turnbull was also opposed, and a certain kind of empiricism of which Hume was a, an exemplar, but which has come to the fore again in contemporary philosophy, not so much as a theory of knowledge, uh, but more broadly in the form of what's come to be known as philosophical naturalism. Though, as we shall see, there's more than one kind of philosophical naturalism. So I've coined this last term empiricalism to distinguish appeals to inner and outer experience, which is what Reed engages in. I mean, the point here is experience is what gets the emphasis. Contrasting it from the reductionist positions developed by Hume and others in the present day, and I believe it fits equally well Reed's own developed position, though so this is perhaps something we'll have an opportunity to discuss following the lecture. Turnbull could not have failed to influence Reed, and there's reason to think that the influence was more than one of general encouragement. Turnbull's Principles of Moral Philosophy, published in 1740, is the, texts, the text of lectures given during the period of his regency at Marshall from 1721 to 1727. It includes a number of particular claims which later find strong echoes in Reed's own realist philosophy. At one point, Turnbull writes about causation, the bringing about of effects, and contends that only, the only active power, as he calls it, the only active power, the only power to bring about effects is the will. In and of itself, nature has no, what he calls, productive energy. Thus, what we experience as causality in nature, as the bringing about of one thing by another, is either, in fact, our own agency or that of another agent operative in things. An interesting idea, not unrelated, of course, to thoughts in natural theology. Elsewhere, Turnbull maintains that our judgments and reasoned conclusions, particularly in the moral sphere, with which he was principally <coughs> concerned, these conclusions should be tested against the measure of what he calls common sense, which is fully adequate, Turnbull teaches us, to determine their truth or falsity. He writes as follows. Common sense is sufficient to teach those who think of the matter with seriousness and attention all the duties of common life, all that is morally fit and binding. Now, both of these notions, the idea about um, the only uh, causal power being uh, an agent, I mean, not in the sense of uh, merely a material substance, but a deliberative agent in some sense, um, that idea uh, and the idea about common sense and the invocation and it providing a kind of standard, both of these notions recur in Reed's own thought, though the idea and role of common sense in Reed is both broadened and deepened. In the Essays on the Act of Powers of 1788, and in an essay published as recently as 2001 in the Philosophical Quarterly, 209 years after he wrote it, uh, Reed argues that we don't normally take that long to get papers into the, <laughs> into the Philosophical Quarterly, though I think some authors feel like it might be like that. Uh, in that essay, which I should explain I edited for the purpose of publishing it in the Philosophical Quarterly, in that hitherto unpublished essay and in these essays on the act of powers, Reed argues that power, strictly speaking, is not the idea of necessitation. It's not the idea of that, an antecedent occurring, that which could not but then uh, yeah. succeed it. It's not, strictly speaking, that idea, but is rather the idea of the exercise of a capacity to produce or not to produce an effect. And this, Reed contends, presupposes both will and understanding. So it's just perhaps emphasizing that. So power, strictly speaking, is not merely the bringing about of one thing by a kind of natural necessitation, but rather is the exercise of a two-way power, a power either to produce or to refrain from producing. And this, of course, raises the question, how would it be the case that an agent should refrain from producing other than perhaps by an exercise of will and understanding. This, by the way, is not the first nor the last time in which Reed speaks in terms that evoke um, not so much the uh, British philosophy of the immediate preceding periods, but the Aristotelianism of both the, the ancient Aristotelians and of the scholastics. 
Well, while thus rejecting Hume's claim that we have no experience of causation as such, interestingly, Reed agrees that when we ordinarily ascribe causality to natural events, when we look upon nature and we say this thing brought about another, we are referring only to an observed regularity. And he writes in terms that uh, should remind us of Hume, or those who've read Hume, we mean nothing more than a constant conjunction by the laws or rules of nature which experience discovers. Now, with regard to common sense, this became, at the expression common sense, this became a term of art in Reed's philosophy. And the set of ideas it represents has been associated predominantly with his name ever since the publication in 1764 of his work, An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. So let's have a moment or two understanding what common sense in Reed's use of it might uh, connote. Well, unlike the sensus communis of the scholastic, this is not a faculty of sense per se. It's not another sense. The, the scholastics had postulated the idea of a kind of unifying sense organ or sense faculty supported by an organ in the interior that would serve to integrate the experiences, the flow of experiences through the different sense modalities. And this provided one answer to the question of how it's possible that you can both hear and see the same thing. You might say that you hear an explosion and you see an explosion. How is that possible? Because the seeing is through one sense modality, the hearing is through another sense modality. So what accounts for the unification and simultaneity of those experiences? And the scholastics suggested that the idea of a common sense, which, as it were, a second order um, operation, which had as inputs to it the products of the first order um, sense experience. Well, this isn't what he means. So it's not a faculty of sense, nor is it a distinctive power of the intellect, nor yet is it the common consensus conceived of as a general opinion. Rather it is, or I take it to be, reason itself, as reason is structured by, or necessarily grasps, a set of principles, the negation of which is either self-contradictory or self-refuting. So I'll say that again. Common sense, as I understand it in Reed, is reason itself operating according to, uh, exercising itself with regard to, a set of principles which are marked out by the following feature. To so negate those principles, to say it is not so, that such and such, is either straight self-contradictory or in some way self-refuting. This isn't one of his examples, but if I were to say, for instance, I am not here, this would be an instance of something that was pretty evidently uh, self-refuting. Reed himself describes it as the first degree of reason which judges of things self-evident. And then he goes on to illustrate various of these self-evident principles and to put them to use against Humean and other skepticisms. Now, I mean, uh, scholars, philosophers, uh, have spent a good deal of time uh, considering these principles individually and collectively, their marks and features. But um, the question I think that is perhaps most important is the status of these principles from the point of view of the effort to reject the skepticism that it was thought that Hume's uh, theory of knowledge um, generated. Hume saw knowledge as rooted in experience, as does uh, Reed very largely, but conceived of experience in the most pared down ways as dealing with the immediate objects of, of, of the senses, the immediate sort of flickering impressions of light or color, the passing, the fragments of sound and so on. Uh, and on that basis, uh, Hume concluded that our ordinary uh, understanding of a world of experience as constructed out of real objects existing in space and time antecedent to our experience of them and so on is really a kind of mental construction out of these various sensory atoms that are the immediate and proper objects of sense experience. And that therefore induced a kind of skepticism because we have no ground in experience itself for judging that there really is a world of structured objects independent of the constructions of our own uh, faculties. But there's another aspect to Hume's uh, skepticism that is relevant here also. 
In Hume's account, all truth pertains either to matters of fact, as he describes them, or to relations of ideas. Now, insofar as the second category are merely definitional, be it explicitly or implicitly so, I mean, for example, a, a statement regarding a matter of fact might be that there are, say, 120 people in this room. That's something that might or might not be the case. It reports a fact, if it is a fact. Um, a statement regarding relations of ideas would be that the sum 120 is divisible by 2. You don't need to know whether there are, in fact, 120 people present. It'll be true whether there are or whether there aren't. That if there are 120 people here, then they could be partitioned into two groups of equal size. Now, insofar as that latter sort of proposition is merely definitional, true in virtue of the terms involved, um, an even number divisible by two and so on, this category of truth is the domain of tautology and contains no genuinely informative truths about reality as such. With regard to the first, matters of fact, Hume's theory of impressions, which I've just referred to, conceived of as distinct mental items between which no um, real necessary connections hold, just ones of, say, psychological association, that undermines the possibility of reasoning from one state of knowledge to another. So according to Hume, what pass for reasonings about the world from one condition or state to another or from statements of fact to statements of requirement and any such reasoning that is not merely engaged in this definitional tautological unpacking, reasoning that claims to concern matters of fact, be it from the passage from is to ought or from effect to cause, are merely habits of mind arising from experiences of conjunction and of contiguity within this domain of impressions, assisted by propensities to project the dispositions onto the world. As Hume says, we tincture it with the hues of sentiment. A nice writer, Hume. Uh, now, Reed saw very clearly the meaning and implications of Hume's ideas. I think more clearly and uh, more directly and distinctly than, than, than almost anyone else. He was, in fact, perhaps the first philosopher to do so, since he was a careful reader of the Treatise of Human Nature, published in January 1739. I could now say exactly 100 years ago, meeting the standards of today's uh, earlier journalism. Uh, since he was, it wasn't 100 years ago. You can do the math, as they say. Since he was a careful reader of the Treatise, published in January 1739, when Hume was, astonishingly, there's 27. A decade later, Hume published a more accessible and less boldly sceptical version of his views in the form of the inquiry. And it was this, not the earlier and more radical treatise, that triggered Kant's awakening from what he, Immanuel Kant, called his dogmatic slumber. It was nearly a quarter of a century before Reed published his rejoinder to Hume's philosophy. But it's clear that the system presented in Reed's inquiry into the human mind had been worked on for many years before. By his own account, he'd been exercised by Hume's skepticism for some 20 years prior to 1764, and it seems likely that the long process of formulating his own alternative account of human knowledge began with readings of Hume in the early 1740s, once he'd become settled as minister of New Macker a parish in the northwest. Uh, I was going to say the northwest of Aberdeen. I'm not sure it isn't the southwest of Aberdeen, New Macca, is it not? Is that, yeah. Anyway, it's somewhere to the west of Aberdeen, to which he was appointed in 1737. The years that followed that appointment saw marriage to his cousin Elizabeth and the start of a family. Two of his daughters were born either side of the 45 Rebellion, and Reed recounts having made the acquaintance of a prominent Jacobite when that gentleman stayed the night at New Macca, while en route to Culloden. The same year as the battle, uh, Reed's 22-year-old wife, Elizabeth, fell ill, and he wrote movingly a petitionary prayer on her behalf. Reed writes as follows. O God, I desire humbly to supplicate thy divine majesty in behalf of my distressed wife, who is by thy hand brought very low and in imminent danger of death, if thou, who alone doest wonders, do not in thy mercy interpose thy mighty arm and bring her back from the gate of death. Well, she was brought back from the gate of death. Elizabeth recovered and lived on until 1792. 
Following her eventual death, however, Reed, who was by then himself 82, wrote to Dougal Stewart, one of his associates, again in humble terms, by the loss of my bosom friend, with whom I lived 52 years, I am brought into a new kind of world, at a time of life when old habits are not easily forgot or new ones acquired. But every world is God's world, and I am thankful for the comforts he has left me. Well, between these periods, these two quotations concerning uh, his love of his wife, between times Reed had begun publishing. He'd been elected to a regent mastership at King's College in 1751. He'd co-founded in 1758 with one of his Gregory cousins the Aberdeen Philosophical Society. In 1762, he received the honor an honorary doctorate of divinity from Marshall College and the following year had been appointed Professor of Moral Philosophy in the University of, Good, uh, of Glasgow in succession to Adam Smith. At about the same time as he accepted the Glasgow chair, Reed sold to a publisher the text of the inquiry, the result, as I, as I say, of 20 years' reflection on Hume's sceptical philosophy. The brief exchange of letters in 1763 between Hume and Reed suggests a high degree of mutual respect. Those familiar with Kant's writings, however, may recall that Prussian's withering comment on Hume's domestic philosophical critics, the so-called uh, common sense philosophers led by Reed. Kant writes as follows. Uh, in contrast to Hume's respectful response, we get from Kant the following. It is positively painful to see how utterly his opponents, Hume's opponents, Reed, Oswald, Beattie, and lastly Priestley, missed the point of the problem. The problem in question was that of causation. They m so misconstrued Hume's valuable suggestion that everything remained in its old condition as if nothing had happened. Now, as it happens, Kant's familiarity with Hume's work was through the later, and I think I said this, yes, through the later and avowedly less unsettling inquiry, whereas Reed had encountered and engaged the ferocious scepticism of the treatise. It may also be added that there is simply no evidence of Kant ever having read Reed's work, as opposed to having read an account of the common sense philosophy. Ferrier, uh, James Frederick Ferrier, by contrast, to whom I shall return shortly, had no such excuse, I think, for missing the point of Reed's philosophy. Well, Reed, having been appointed to the chair of moral philosophy in Glasgow, remained there for 30 years. In 1773, he was visited by Boswell and Dr. Johnson on their way back from the tour of the Western Highlands. The travelers entertained the distinguished professor to breakfast and supper, it was a long day, um, at the Saracen's Head Inn in the East End. Now, you have to, <laughs> you have to know what bears the title today, the Sari Heed, to quite get the point of this. Uh, its current successor, the Sari Heed, uh, is still there, though not, at least in my experience of it, a frequent haunt of literary figures. <laughs> if you want to get the full... <laughs> resonance of that, you need to um, pay a visit to the Barrows in Glasgow and then just cross the road to the Sari Heed. It does, however, this is a nice touch, it does contain in the window, however, rather faded and sad and stained and so on, two or three uh, small sort of uh, uh, oval uh, watercolours, one of which showing a carriage arriving, because in fact when carriages arrived in Glasgow, this is where they were sort of set down and they'd be taken off to the Saracen's Head. Uh, for some refreshments. But anyway, Boswell records nothing at all of the conversation beyond remarking that the professors did not venture to expose themselves much to the battery of cannon which they knew might play upon them. Ever one to ingratiate himself with Dr. Johnson and try and do himself a favour along the way. Well, any suggestion that Reed might be lacking in communicative skills or intellectual resources is wholly countered by the record of his correspondence with Lord Kames, formerly Henry Hume, which ranges widely over various subjects and includes what I believe uh, to be the first discussion of a brain transplant personal identity thought experiment. And Reed's amiability and generosity of spirit certainly matched those of Hume, who was famous for such uh, characteristics. Although he was an orthodox Christian of the Presbyterian mold, uh, 
and a moral rigorist of conservative disposition, Reed appreciated principles of religious and political liberty, as is strikingly attested to in a letter of 1791 addressed to an unidentified recipient. There has been speculation as to who the, that recipient was. And the editor of um, Reed's correspondence speculates that it was somebody called George Hay. Um, I have good reason for thinking it wasn't George Hay, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, it is uh, a Romanist. Um, Reed writes in 1791 uh, from Glasgow, Dear Sir, I have been in your debt as a correspondent since Christmas. You then rejoiced in the return of that anniversary, because this is the, the Romish celebration of Christmas. You then rejoiced in the return of that anniversary and in the great events which had happened in our neighboring kingdom, both civil and ecclesiastical. This is referring to the development of Catholic emancipation, or proposals thereof. In all of this, I think you did what might become a good prefectorian. Again, I think a reference both to the Romish uh, character of this fellow and also perhaps his occupancy of some office within the Roman Catholic Church, which is what led the editor to think that George Hay was probably the intended, uh, the, uh, gave the identity of the man. But anyway, it reads, says, I give you the right hand of fellowship. Among the wonders of our day, 1791, among the wonders of our day, let the pure wine of Rome and Geneva mix leaving the dregs behind. And it's remarkable, 1791. Let the pure wine of Rome and Geneva mix, leaving the dregs behind. Some of us have different views about the proportions of those two wines that might go into the mix, but that's another matter. He continues, I give you joy with all my heart upon the relief granted to protesting Roman Catholics. And I doubt not, but we both rejoice in the new constitution of Poland and in the wise and magnanimous conduct of the French Assembly on the elopement and return of their king. I've been very long persuaded that a nation, to be free, needs only to know the rights of man. I have lived to see this knowledge spread far beyond my most sanguine hopes and produce glorious effects. God grant it may spread more and more, and that those who taste the, the sweets of liberty may not turn giddy, but make a wise and sober use of it. This bears, of course, upon the matter that, um, in which Edmund Burke was to take a rather different view. Some few here think or affect to think that to be a friend of the revolution of France is to be an enemy to the constitution of Britain, or at least to its present administration. I know the contrary to be true in myself and verily believe that most of my acquaintance who rejoice in that revolution agree with me in this. He goes on to say that he, he's agreed to um, be a sponsor for a meeting of Friends of the French Revolution on the 14th of July uh, in Glasgow and so on. But a very remarkable uh, letter, which I think, as I say, pays very ample tribute to or provides ample evidence for my claim that he was a man of both amiability and generosity. Now, in 1774, Reed, Reed published... Um, a work entitled, a brief work, A Brief Account of Aristotle's Logic. And this was, a, uh, was published as an appendix to Lord Kame's Sketches of the History of Man. This, in fact, was his only publication, I think, while teaching at Glasgow University. While teaching at Glasgow University. A month after his 70th birthday, he wrote to Kames to report that he found himself growing old. And, he'd re and, and reporting also that he'd requested that the College of Glasgow, the Glasgow uh, in the period of, of, of Reed. Those are the only two illustrations, so it's hardly a picture show, but anyway. Um, as I say, this was the only uh, publication then, the, uh, and he, he, he let Keynes know that he was intending to retire. What he then did, however, was to set about amending and developing his Glasgow lectures uh, for publication. And this material appeared in two stages, in 1785 as Essays on the Intellectual Powers and in 1788 as Essays on the Active Powers. Well, in 1792, Elizabeth died and Reed was kept company thereafter by his third child and daughter, Martha. And when, in 1796, her father passed away, she returned to Aberdeenshire, the homeland of the Reeds. Eight years later, Kant also died so we might say that within a decade, there ended the lives of the two great anti-sceptical 
contemporaries of Hume. People might speculate, indeed people have speculated, uh, on the matter of how these two great figures might be compared, uh, Reed and Kant. Kant's influence has unquestionably been the greater, and you might argue that his imaginative power was superior, and certainly the range of his philosophical achievement was greater. Yet his writing is notoriously difficult, and usually most obscure, where it's most important to be clear. Read by contrast, is wholly devoid of pretension, and lays so great an emphasis upon clarity and brevity of expression that his prose is perhaps the most modern of any, um, any uh, 18th century writer. Now, uh, Gordon referred to the, uh, the impact of Reed uh, in North America. I was going to uh, offer you a section on that, but I think that's unnecessary, and it will have full celebration, which no doubt will be recorded in some publication uh, later this year across the water at Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, so let me um, uh, turn now to the question of Reed on the art of philosophy. And before I do so, the one thing I want to check is a very practical matter of when it is that we break from this section to the, to the uh, discussion. That's all right. I've got three hours still. I'm fine. I've got plenty, <laughs> plenty of time. Right. Uh, so let me turn to the matter then of Reed on the art of philosophy. And first of all, I think I need to, to do that. I want to say a little bit more about Hume. The continuing potency, the power of Hume's thought, resides, I think, in part in its ambiguity. That's to say, I mean, it's overall ambiguity, not particular ambiguities, but a general ambiguity. That is to say, in its suggesting not one but two philosophies, a little like Wittgenstein in this respect, but perhaps with Wittgenstein these came in sequence. With Hume they seem to be simultaneously present. The first of these philosophies is avowedly and fully sceptical, and that's what Kant and Hume uh, and uh, Reed were troubled by. It challenges our claims to real philosophical knowledge of nature, of value, of metaphysics, and so on. Knowledge that we may have presumed to have acquired primarily either by reflection upon ideas or by direct observation, or from the accounts of other persons deriving from their use of their faculties of reflection or observation. In this the first philosophy of Hume, as it were, or one, one interpretation of Hume's overall philosophy, the sceptical system, the various certainties of self and of world are dissolved into associations of impressions and ideas. Personal ident identity, the very cement of the mind, causality, the cement of the universe, are reduced merely to collections of distinct granular existences. Where for long and unquestionably there appeared unified and enduring realities, there is now but a mosaic of momentary tesserae, a mere sequence of discrete impressions. In the second account, however, which I shall call now the restorationist account, Hume's philosophy is reassuring, being both humane and benign. The philosophical abstractors' pretensions having been identified for what they are, namely abstract philosophical reflections, exercises of detached theorizing, we are then able to return to a mature common sense in which the world and the thinker are simply accepted as parts of the ordinary given. This is where Hume as Wittgenstein, you might say. And here nature is the beginning and the end of things, and the appropriate philosophical disposition is conservative rather than radical. Now, it long was and still remains a matter of serious dispute whether Hume should be seen as an unsettling radical or as a reassuring conservative. He tends, tends to be seen in different guises in different periods, no doubt reflecting in part what the preoccupations and felt threats of those periods are. On either side of this, which is not merely an exegetical dispute, familiar texts are cited, unfamiliar ones excavated, and so on. But what I want to do, uh, in order to lead me back to read now, is to say that one way of regarding Hume is as, a, is, I mean, nothing novel in this, I mean, this has been a subject of much discussion, one way of regarding Hume is as a certain kind of naturalist. Like Aristotle, uh, he was a philosophical naturalist, but whereas Aristotle had an expansive notion of nature, Hume seems to have had a more contracted one. Interestingly, however, he was willing to involve natural categories in respect to the human mind that he wasn't, allowed, uh, wasn't willing to allow to external nature as that was experienced in sight and in hearing. Uh, 
Now, we might consider, therefore, how Hume would have responded to a critic of his philosophical scepticism who complained not that he was insufficiently uh, open to uh, rational necessities and so on, but rather that he was neglectful, first of the possibility of relations that were not purely logical ones, but relations that are captured by the ideas of powers, liabilities, and tendencies, as expressed, as these are expressed, powers, liabilities, and tendencies, as these are expressed through enduring natures. So, as it were, the power of a substance to dissolve another um, is expressed through the enduring, uh, partly constitutes, is expressed through the enduring nature of the first, and indeed uh, tells us something about the, the nature of that which is thereby dissolved. And what he might also have said in response to someone who argued that we have the possibility of recognizing these powers and dispositions and so on through intelligent perception. In other words, we might ask how he would have responded to a real thinking Aristotelian. Now, what I want to suggest is that Reed can be thought of to some degree as just such a person, as uh, a real thinking Aristotelian. Because interestingly, in his response to uh, Hume, what he spends a great deal of time on is um, developing and exploiting just these sorts of notions, ideas of powers, liabilities, tendencies, natures, and so on. Uh, and we saw that earlier on when he, he said of that uh, causation was not just the necessitation of one thing by another, but the expression of um, uh, the expression of a power to do or to refrain from doing. Now, in the interest of, of, of brevity at this point, I'm just going to um, uh, draw out two uh, elements um, of uh, Hume's, uh, sorry, of Reed's philosophy uh, in response to uh, a couple of challenges. And that will return me to the sense in which I think uh, Reed can be seen to some extent as standing in the tradition of a kind of Aristotelian naturalism that contrasts with uh, both with the rather radical a priorism of Kant and of Ferrier on the one hand, and with the empiricism of Hume and modern empiricism on the other. I mentioned earlier that the Kantian um, challenge against the common sense philosophy was that it didn't take seriously enough at the terms of Hume's skepticism, that it thought it could somehow escape um, the objections that uh, Hume pressed upon ordinary uh, belief by simply reasserting those beliefs now in the mode of uh, expressions of common sense. Um, Ferrier, in the 19th century, gives a sort of super-boosted version of that uh, criticism. Uh, he writes at one point, the turning round of thought from psychology to metaphysics is the true interpretation of the platonic conversion of the soul from ignorance to knowledge and from mere opinion to certainty and satisfaction. In other words, from a discipline in which the thinking is only apparent to a discipline in which the thinking is real. This is pretty withering stuff. But what it's directed against when he talks about the turning from psychology to metaphysics is that Ferrier in the 19th century and this verdict was very influential upon subsequent um, philosophers and partly explains the neglect of, of Reed. Ferrier launches the attack upon the, the Scottish common sense philosophers that they've actually stopped doing philosophy and started merely to do psychology. Instead of engaging with philosophical arguments and responding to them with counter arguments and criticisms, mm -hmm. they're merely invoking certain facts about human psychology, such as that we are disposed to believe this or believe that. At another point, Ferrier says the following, language itself and consequently the very nature of thought render impractical anything like a true and real science of the human mind if mind be conceived as an object of research, its vital distinguishing and fundamental phenomenon, namely consciousness, necessarily becomes invisible. If we try to look at mind and we, we might do scientifically, we lose sight of that very thing that is most characteristic of mind, namely consciousness inasmuch as it adheres tenaciously to the side of the inquiring subject, and that if it be again invested with this phenomenon, it becomes from that moment inconceivable as an object. What Ferrier is saying here is this, that the essence of mind is consciousness, and therefore if we wish to understand mind, we can't do through the medium of psychology conceived of as a science, which regards the mind simply as another object in the world or a set of characteristics in the world. Rather, we have to do it through a particular uh, method, 
which he describes as that of a priori philosophy, and understand the constitutive principles of mind by a kind of rational logic. Now, the conclusion of that uh, movement on the part of Ferrier, first of all, its influence on the culture, on the philosophical culture of the period, was to do further damage to the cause of the common sense tradition, because he represents it merely as engaging in a kind of science that can only tell us about the particularities of this or that characteristic. It can't pass into the very essence of mind itself, and nor can it pass out of uh, from mind to an understanding of the reality for which which mind is adapted. That's uh, one uh, consequence. Uh, another consequence is to take philosophy in a direction uh, that becomes sort of hyper-rationalist. Uh, Ferrier believed that he could deduce the whole of his metaphysical system, and believe me, it was quite an extensive one, simply from the principle of non-contradiction, from a simple logical principle, such as that something, uh, it's not possible that, a should, that something should be such and such and not such and such. From that alone, he thought that you could extract the whole of metaphysics. Now, um, he was clearly, um, I was going to say off his rocker, he was clearly um, uh, overly ambitious as far as the scope of philosophy is concerned in supposing that that was possible. But what I want to suggest is that Ferrier, in his attack on the common sense tradition deriving from Reed, partly misunderstands that because like Kant, he attends too much to the successors of Reed who are genuinely second-rate figures, uh, rather than to read himself. But he also does great damage to philosophy because he brings it into a kind of ridicule. If, if what we have to choose between is, a, is a, a study of nature, on the one hand, that is merely an observation of objects in space and time, or on the other hand, have as our highest aspiration for knowledge this crazed attempt to deduce everything from a single logical principle that's given intuitively in self-reflection, then it's, uh, we might regard it as an unhappy choice, but it's one in which I think philosophy will certainly lose out. The greatness of Reed, it seems to me, is that he actually negotiates for us a course between these two extremes. On the one hand, he thinks that uh, philosophy is possible and can yield substantive and significant knowledge, both about our own nature, about the nature of the world, about the relationships between ourselves and the world, about, as he would see it, a cause of the world, and also about the principles that should regulate our, our conduct, both individually in our moral lives and collectively in our social and political lives. He thinks that that is possible. But he thinks it's to be achieved not by reflecting on some pure logical principles, but by inquiring into what we are acquainted with, which is both the world on the one hand and ourselves on the other. But we're acquainted with those not by, construct, by some curious construction of the sort that Hume uh, proposes and advances, but rather by a direct engagement both with the subject, ourself in reflection, and with the world in observation. And... Um, he gives an account, which we can perhaps return to in the discussion, but he, he has things to say about where it is that um, Hume uh, has gone wrong in this. I mean, I'll just mention one point about a famous quotation for those who know their way around Reed. He says, in popular language, idea signifies the same thing as conception, apprehension, notion. To have an idea of anything is to conceive it. According to the philosophical meaning of the word, however, philosophical in a bad sense, it does not signify that act of mind which we call thought or conception, but some peculiar object existing in the mind and so on. And he fairly systematically, through a careful study and analysis of language and the way in which language is used, reveals that there's no reason for passing in the direction in which Hume had taken philosophy, and indeed there's every reason not to do so. I want, however, just finally and briefly to connect all of this to the current condition and circumstance of philosophy um, and uh, to do so in a way that relates the dialectic or the terms of the opposition that I've already mentioned historically, Hume at one end, Ferry at another, to the contemporary condition uh, of philosophy as we find it, practiced certainly in um, North America and in Britain. To some extent, there is with us today the a priorism or an aspiration to the a priorism that uh, Ferrier saw as the only possible reply to, um, uh, to skepticism. 
That expresses itself in a philosophical view, or one of the ways in which it expresses itself, is the philosophical view that tries to show that skepticism is overcome by showing its very impossibility. There is no, there is no possibility of our failing to engage with the objects of knowledge because, in a sense, the objects of knowledge are constituted by the, acts, the act of knowledge itself. Now, this, this is a kind of solution which is... Um, it starts from a different place than Hume, but for, oddly enough ends up with a, a position a bit like Hume. It in, interiorizes the world and, though, uh, and in that respect avoids the possibility of a gap between uh, us and the world. That, rather like Ferrier's um, own view, Ferrier's more extreme view, has not attracted um, an enduring um, constituency of support. What has, however, and is growing, it seems to me, is the counterpart of a certain kind of naturalism that we see glimpses of in Hume. This is a naturalism that, uh, a certain kind of skeptical naturalism that thinks that the whole philosophical enterprise, insofar as that is a special kind of inquiry into the nature of the subject, the nature of reality, the nature of value and so on, that that whole enterprise is misconceived. That if you like, there is nothing to be discovered beyond what science itself engages with. Now, um, we can, I hope perhaps we will discuss this, but the aspect of that I just want to sort of draw out on this is that if that were right, you might think this is a sort of professional interest and continuing to be employed, but if that were right, there would be no scope for uh, philosophy. But if, of course, there were no scope for philosophy, then there would be no possibility of the kind of critical engagement with science that is necessary, whether it be questioning some of the, 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 specula the, the, theory, the theoretical speculations of science, or indeed questioning some of the practical directions in which it's been taken, if there were no possibility of a kind of critical philosophy, um, uh, then we would indeed be, I'm inclined to say, victims to these forces uh, uh, through the inquiry uh, into nature, conceived of in the barest possible way. What I think that Thomas Reed offers us is a view of the nature of philosophy that raises it up to a, a kind of dignity in as much as it is an inquiry into nature, both the nature as we encounter it and experience in nature in ourselves, but without the absurd pretensions of thinking that in inquiry into nature we're inquiring into some other domain of special kinds of facts, Ferrier thought, some special kinds of logical necessities and so on. No, according to, uh, fair, uh, according to Reed, we're investigating the thing of which we're familiar and the thing that is revealed to us in the sort of wise and prudent judgment that uh, philosophy aims to reflect, how, uh, to arrive at, I'm sorry, as supported and sustained by these undergirdings in the principles of common sense. But these are matters for some further discussion. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, John. We have, I think, about uh, 15 minutes for comments, questions, uh, reflections. So, yeah. so, do we have any? Alexander. It's Professor Brody. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful uh, lecture. I, I found it hugely stimulating from start to finish. I should say that I'm perhaps one of the few people in this room who's a genuine admirer of uh, Ferrier. And um, <clears throat> I, I, I want to say that um, there, there seemed to me to be um, something ad ad additional that had to be said in, in your exposition. Otherwise, there's something really left dangling. That is that he's got a ferocious attack on, uh, on, on Reed um, based on the fact that and the, the whole enlightenment idea of a science of man is misconceived because insofar as it is seen as very much an empirical investigation into the nature of mind, well, they're missing out the mind that's doing the investigating. Uh, that's to say the thing on the other side of consciousness. I actually think there's a huge amount to be said about this, but never mind. It's, it's just that you said that this is one of the reasons why um, Reed's reputation um, started to sink. Now, the fact is that this particular line of uh, Ferrier's is very strongly argued, and the effective line of, of Ferrier's works every bit as well against Hume, uh, who was engaged in the same identical um, investigation 
reputation of the science of man, but it had absolutely no effect whatsoever on Hume's reputation, and I wonder why a reach would be so damaged by this okay. when Hume isn't touched. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm not entirely undermining of, of, of Ferrier myself. Um, indeed, I think, uh, if I remember this correctly, I wrote the introduction to the reprint of his philosophical works and to uh, a, a little book published by Elizabeth Haldane in 1899, I think, on, on I mean, reprint. I didn't write the introduction in 1899. Uh, but, um, the, the, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, let, let's take Ferrier, first of all, in relation to Hume. Hume... Um, so, so the picture of, of knowledge that Hume uh, gives us is, is this, that we really, uh, it is a very radical um, empiricism. We find ourselves at some stage that we are, it's impossible for us to, to, to recall, but we find ourselves at some stage moving from um, simply being located at the midst of, um, at the center of a kind of sensory bombardment, you know, the kind of thing that William James would subsequently write about in the booming, buzzing experience of the infant and so on, that we find ourselves moving from that to a circumstance in which we have, uh, as, as it seems to us, uh, a perception of the world and of all sorts of things, the world made up of objects, including ourselves, things and so on. But now Hume invites us to actually probe that understanding of the world and ask where we really do find the foundations for it. And given his account of experience, really we're hard pressed to answer that because he says, for example, if we consider uh, the causation, one thing producing another and so on like this, all we actually see have, have is a, a, set of one, a, a sense of one state of things and then another state of things, but show me the connection between them that is the causation and so on. And he does this systematically. And he says, and moreover, when you turn your reflection in upon yourself and try to find that thinking self which you call you, then all we have are more impressions of these psychological states and so on, these passing fancies or whatever it might be. Now, Ferrier's response to that is to say that um, what Hume failed to notice was that the very idea of an act of cognition, of a knowing, as it were, of a thinking and so on, has built into it both the idea of an object and of a subject. That, as it were, that we don't have to find the object uh, as if it were beyond the act somewhere out there and have these skeptical worries as to whether it's really there or not. That the very idea of an object of cognition is given through the idea of cognition, or equally, if you like, put it the other way around, the very idea of cognition is the idea of an encounter between a cognizer and um, uh, that which is cognized. So to put it in another vocabulary, that of Kant, I suppose we might say, Ferrier seeks to transcendentally deduce the existence of the objects of cognition and of the subject of cognition. And he thinks that um, Hume is mistaken to think that these would have to, if these exist, they'd have to be given through another kind of experience. No, they're, they're, they're in one sense they're given an experience, but by the very logical nature of experience itself and so on. Now he does, and this is very briefly, he does bring this uh, some, somewhat similar criticisms, as you say, against the psychological science of man, which simply, you know, would, would investigate us through observation and such like. Um, in fact, I'll just quote you one little bit that I didn't quote. He says, if it should appear that this science of the human mind carries in its conception such a radical defect that all the true and distinctive phenomena of man necessarily elude its grasp, and so on and so on, he continues like this. So the question is, given that his criticisms are, are telling against Hume, and perhaps telling against Reed, we discussed that and so on, why was it that Hume's reputation uh, survived in a way that uh, Reed's did not? That's a very good question. I think part of the explanation may be that Reed was not well served by those who promoted the Reedian philosophy, some of who I think did, did regress to an understanding of what common sense was that really was just bluff. Um, that, you know, a, a touch of the eye refute you thus, you know, kicking the stone and so on. So I think it may have been the case, and I don't know the answer to this, and it's partly an historical question, but it may have been the case that Reed suffered uh, more for the want of uh, effective um, exponents of his view, whereas perhaps there were more effective exponents, or people had the impression at any rate uh, of Hume's uh, philosophy as being more effectively expressed. Lord Sutherland. Thank you very much, John. The super lecture stimulated an old mind into all sorts of thoughts that we have discussed at various times. Just two or three snippets of footnotes. Yeah. One on, on the point you were making, actually, 
philosophers' friends often have a lot to answer for. And I, I think one of the key things that affected uh, the, the reputation of the whole common sense school was the attack by uh, on Sir William Hamilton's philosophy by John Stuart Mill that actually redirected there in the middle of the 19th century um, uh, away from that tradition and reasserted uh, Mill's version of, uh, of a Hume's very tough empiricism, in fact. Uh, uh, but I think you're wrong to say Hume's reputation hasn't suffered. He's had his ups and downs as, as much as, as, as uh, Reed had and indeed was very out of fashion until uh, Kemp Smith helped uh, dig him out again uh, 100 years or so. Go. Two, two other quick footnotes. One, um, the, uh, I, I hope when you're uh, considering the influence of Hume more broadly, uh, you stray beyond North America to South America. Because uh, read. The, yeah, read, read, sorry, yes, read. Yes, yes. Because the common sense school had very significant impact in very practical ways in setting up the republics following the, the uh, anti-colonial wars uh, in which the Span Spaniards were thrown out. And there is a story to be told there. It wasn't great philosophy philosophy, and indeed uh, uh, Dougal Stewart was one of the people whose work was often invoked uh, in that context as well. So there is a story there, but I won't, clearly won't go into that. Third, slightly more contentious point, one of the differences between Hume and Reed was clearly on religion. Now, it wasn't just a matter of their background and what they stuck with, but there are very important distinction. Hume, of course, attacked very, very strongly the arguments for the existence of God based on analogy read effectively accepted that pattern of argument and that may, be, may have something to do with the fact that as you suggested uh, Hume focused away from the empirical world the objective world out there and, and focused particularly on the, the, the what human beings are doing and thinking and saying but there was a, a clear distinction there that separates them out Thank you yes. very much I'll come back, I'll take another one and then come back yes, to the, yes fine, yes. I've noted them, thank you to what extent are the universities uh, reflecting the need for philosophers, students of philosophy, also to be aware of biology and the whole nature of science? Right. <laughs> yes. Hey. That'll be next week's lecture. Uh, Go on. <laughs> are you all uh, yeah, in here? Yeah. You mentioned uh, Reed's criticism of treating ideas as yes. objects. Yeah. I, I wondered why you didn't mention uh, Reed's notion of natural signs, mm -hmm. which natural I feel signs, yes, yes. Uh, is perhaps his most interesting idea, yes, which suggests an entirely different relation between language and experiences, so that they are not descriptive objects but uh, experience is very akin to uh, language and it uh, suggests a quite different uh, idea of the language of mind. Thank you very much. Yes. Let, let me just uh, have one more question here and then give John the remaining <laughs> few minutes to wrap it up. Where was that? Uh, you had a question? I think there's a <coughs> microphone coming to you. Uh, Reed was a minister and presumably uh, uh, believed in, uh, in his religion. Um, what direct impact did that have on his philosophy? Right, gosh. <laughs> uh, so let me just very quickly um, uh, try to deal with each of those. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Lord Sutherland's uh, remarks are very interesting about for, uh, yes, you, who your friends are isn't always in your own best interest, yes. And certainly Mill's attack on, on Hamilton and uh, not only the, the effect that it had upon, um, well, the standing of this Scottish philosophy, actually, but also the um, re-expression of a quite radical empiricism of, of Hume's own. I think, um, the, actually, to some extent, the uh, relative um, fate of these two philosophers actually does turn on the other point you made about their attitudes towards religion. Because part of when, I mean, when Hume goes out of favor, part of the reason he goes out of favor is not because of criticisms about his fundamental epistemology, but rather the long legacy of the idea of his being a dangerous 
atheist, be it that he probably wasn't an atheist, strictly speaking, but anyway, there's another matter. On the, on the matter of South America, I don't know about South America. I do know, however, of course, that one of the places it's worth talking about his influence outside the English-speaking world, because famously Victor Cousin and so on in, in France, uh, Reed was taken up there, and Alexander will be able to tell me that in Spain also, um, and Portugal perhaps, I don't know, uh, but in Iberia, the Iberian region, there was an interest in Reed. I think, don't think I knew about the South America, but we'll add that to the file. Um, and certainly, yes, Reed and Hume, uh, Reed and Hume on religion is, is, a, is a, key, a, a key difference, both internally with regard to their philosophies and with regard to the reception of them. So with that in mind, let me skip to the last question and come back. Uh, what was the impact of his re religious beliefs upon his philosophy? Or, Well, let me treat that in a more limited way. Where did it show itself in his philosophy? I think one place where it shows itself is his deep providentialism. Um, and uh, you, you see that both, as it were, pastorally, if I can put it that way, in the reflections that I quoted uh, in that prayer uh, for the fate of his wife uh, and then later on where he really does sort of, he does see the human affairs as under the governance of God for the best and so on. So there's a, there's a, quite, there's a, pro, a sense of a providentialism. Uh, that, that's it as well at the pastoral level. And an interesting question, which is, this is not the occasion to go into, it simply isn't time, as to what extent that really does square with the question of double predestination and so on. So to what extent he was, in fact, at issue with his own Calvinism, I don't know. I mean, we heard in that other passage where he's, you know, talking about the, the, the wines of Geneva and of Rome mixing and the dregs being left behind. I'm not sure whether one of the dregs might be the doctrine of double predestination. Uh, but that's another matter. But I mean, I do think there's a sense of grace in, in, in Reed, which is really very, I won't say charming, but that makes it sound rather superficial. I mean, it's really quite a, something to be taken account of. But it also plays its role in this idea of the constitution of our nature to which he returns. And that actually is going to bring me to the question of natural signs. It is true that Reed emphasizes, as the Stoics had in antiquity and as the medievals did, the doctrine of signs. And he makes exactly the same distinction as the scholastics between natural signs and artificial signs. And then the subdivision of those follows the scholastic pattern because within natural signs he distinguishes between those that record just a relation of cause and effect merely, say smoke and fire for instance, and those in which there is a relation of some sort, but including a propensity of the mind to move from one to the other. Uh, I mean, not as a matter of empirical discovery. I mean, it's a discovery that smoke is a product of fire. But there are other kinds of signs, natural signs of things, in which we don't discover. Indeed, he suspects that we couldn't discover that these things are correlated. And one are facial expressions. He thinks that facial expressions are natural signs of the psychological states that ex in which they are expressed. So a smile is a natural sign uh, of a state of mind and so on. But also, as you say, I think that ideas are natural signs of their objects. But now you might say, well, how does that work if it isn't this causal uh, uh, relationship and so on? And of course, famously, he doesn't tell us. He says, for example, that this, uh, that, that, that this possibility operates as if it were by a kind of natural magic. Um, and that may, of course, return us to the question of uh, the providentialism, that God has so ordained it that we're constituted in such a way. But then finally, I just wanted to... Um, maybe that is it. Well, oh, philosophy and biology. Yes, I, I was keeping that one to the end, wasn't I? Right. Um, to what extent... Well, sorry, was the concern that... Uh, sorry, where was the gentleman's here? Was, it the, was the concern that the way in which philosophy is taught today pays insufficient attention to the natural sciences? Was that perhaps your concern? Or? Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, it's very hard to generalize in a way. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, you know, the philosophy of science is certainly a branch of philosophy that is taught within the universities, for example, the philosophy of science, studying its methods and its concerns. Um, it's also the case, I mean, this is what I was touching on a little too hurriedly towards the end, that there is a quite pervasive influence on what you might call a scientific philosophy. So the idea that fundamental questions about cognition or about value or about the nature of causality or time or whatever else it might be are to be answered by scientific inquiry and scientific speculation rather than by some particular philosophical method. But if you had in mind beyond that just the question as to whether or not philosophy might be a sort of slightly self-isolating <laughs> study, um, I'm inclined to say that the, 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 the nature of study these days is, 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 is under such pressures 
that probably people do focus a little too narrowly on what's immediately before them. But I don't think that's peculiar to philosophy. I think that's just the, the condition of the universities. But don't get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> I invite Lord Wilson to conclude the proceedings. Well, thank you very much indeed. There's a tremendous attraction, I think, in a philosopher who causes philosophy common sense. Um, and I think there's a tremendous attraction in, in a lecturer who, fairly or not about fairly, I can just say he's off his rocker, um, in a very, very straightforward account. I mean, for me, you brought to life and gave a sense of humanity to that wonderful Rayburn portrait where Reed actually looks rather sad. Um, but you've given life to him, and I, I think probably to all of us here in the audience, life or a resurrection to the life of, of his philosophy. Um, extraordinary that a man of that ability should be so little known in his own country, so widely known in the United States, and as Lord Sutherland was saying, has had an influence in South America as well. There's a certain poignancy about this lecture for me and, and your article in The Scotsman this morning because I realized from both that I spent the last few days about two miles away from where Reed was born because that is where we have a little cottage in the hills of Aberdeenshire. Uh, I also realized from the dates that um, when he was born uh, in the neighboring parish, uh, one of my forebears was the schoolmaster. Uh, and if I can have one tiny little point of maybe for your next lecture, in the cussed way of people in that area, they pronounce the village which is spelt Strachan as Strawn. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for, for, for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.